During the American Civil War, most Southerners remained loyal to their home states, but others defied their roots to fight for the Union and the abolition of slavery. These are some of the Southern commanders who chose the Union. Known as Old Fuss and Feathers, General Winfield Scott was one of the oldest generals in the Union Army when the Civil War broke out in 1861. Born in Petersburg, Virginia on June 13, 1786, the Union was barely a decade old when Scott entered the world. He joined the cavalry of the Virginia militia in his early 20s. He later joined the Union Army and served in the War of 1812 and was the top Union general during the Mexican-American War in the 1840s. After a failed bid for the U.S. presidency, he served in the Pig War in the 1850s. When the Civil War broke out, Scott was still a commanding major general in charge of Union forces. He chose to stay loyal to the Union rather than rejoin the Virginia militia. By this point, Scott was in his 70s and he wasn't as effective a commander as he was when he was younger. He retired before the the end of 1861 and died on May 29, 1866. Of all the Southern generals and admirals who fought for the Union in the Civil War, perhaps the most famous is Admiral David Farragut. Farragut was born in Tennessee the day after Independence Day in 1801, son of a Spanish merchant. While still a boy, he moved to Virginia and began living with Captain David Porter, whose son would later serve alongside Farragut during the Civil War. As incredible as it sounds, Farragut joined the Navy at the age of nine and served in the War of 1812 while still a preteen. In 1824, he received his first independent command, and the following year he became a lieutenant. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, Farragut was a captain, and he chose to stay loyal to the Union Navy he'd been a part of for most of his life. His most famous exploits came during the liberation of New Orleans, Louisiana in 1862 and the capture of Vicksburg in 1863 alongside Ulysses S. Grant. In 1862, Farragut received his commission as a rear admiral, and in 1864, he became vice admiral, the first in Navy history. He followed that by becoming the first admiral in U.S. Navy history in 1866. Farragut died on August 14, 1870, and has since had five different Navy ships commissioned in his honor. If anyone personified the conflict that Southerners who fought for the Union during the Civil War felt, it was Old Slow Trot, Major General George Henry Thomas. A Southern boy through and through, Thomas was born on July 31, 1816 on a Virginia plantation. His family owned slaves and believed in the importance of slavery, a conviction that would later drive a wedge between them and their son. After graduating from West Point in 1840, Thomas joined the Union Army. He would serve with Braxton Bragg and Robert E. Lee, both of whom would later become Confederate Army generals. When the war broke out, Thomas stayed loyal to the Union, and his family and friends back home in Virginia never forgave him for it. He became a major general and earned distinction for serving at the Battle of Chickamauga, where he fought against his former comrade Bragg. For the men who survived, Chickamauga would be remembered as one gigantic brawl. There he earned the nickname the Rock of Chickamauga and the command of the Army of the Cumberland. He took part in the takeover of Atlanta after being passed over for head command in favor of William Tecumseh Sherman. Thomas died of a stroke on March 28, 1870. Today, a statue of Thomas stands in his namesake Thomas Circle in downtown Washington, D.C. He forever overlooks his native Virginia. Brigadier General William Rufus Terrell was another Southerner who chose to stay loyal to the Union when the Civil War broke out. Born on April 21, 1834 in Covington, Virginia, Terrell's family was split apart by the war. While William decided to fight for the North, three of his brothers joined the Confederate Army. His father wrote him a scathing letter saying, How it makes my heart bleed to think that while Virginia's sons are rallying to the defense of her firesides and her homes, that my son is found playing the part of Benedict Arnold. Terrell's father threatened to hang him should he return to Virginia and strike his name from the family record, but ended with a P.S. that was the equivalent of a carrot on a stick, writing, The governor of Virginia has frequently inquired for you and has been ready to give you a permission fully equal to that you now hold. If you conclude to retrace your steps and return to Virginia, you will be taken care of. But Terrell didn't take the bait. The Union Army made him a captain, and he fought with distinction at the Battle of Shiloh in April 1862. After participating in the Siege of Corinth a few weeks later, Terrell was made a Brigadier General. He died on October 8, 1862, while commanding troops at the Battle of Perryville. His brother James Barber Terrell, a Confederate Army General, died in 1864 at the Battle of Bethesda Church and was buried on the field. Born on June 13, 1809, Brevet Major General Philip St. George Cook was a native of Loudoun County, Virginia. He left Virginia at 14 to attend West Point and returned to the South as a lieutenant in a Missouri Infantry Regiment. Cook took part in both the Black Hawk War in the 1830s, where he was promoted to first lieutenant in 1834, and the Mexican-American War in the 1840s. Conquering the West was America's manifest destiny, right? He became a brevet lieutenant colonel in 1849 and a full lieutenant colonel in 1854. 
When the Civil War broke out, Cook gave little thought to remaining loyal to Virginia. He immediately threw his lot in with the Union, and his family was split apart. His son John Rogers Cook became a brigadier general for the Confederacy, and two of his sons-in-law, including famed Confederate cavalryman Jeb Stuart, also fought for the South. One of his sons-in-law fought for the Union with him. Just months after the war broke out, Cook attained the rank of brigadier general, but he was removed from the field in 1863 likely because he was a steadfast believer in the cavalry charge as a battle tactic, long after the advent of modern weaponry had rendered it obsolete. He was prevented a major general or promoted without a pay raise in 1866. Cook continued his service, commanding several different armies until his retirement in 1873. He was able to reconnect with his Confederate son before his death, which occurred on March 20, 1895. Many Civil War generals and admirals took prominent positions in the government following the end of the war, and one of the most prominent was Brigadier General and later Governor of Texas, Edmund Jackson Davis. Davis was born on October 2, 1827 in St. Augustine, Florida, but he made his antebellum reputation in the state of Texas. There, he became a notable attorney and eventually the district attorney of the 12th District at Brownsville. In 1856, Davis became a judge, but when he didn't support Texas's succession for the Union in early 1861, he lost his judgeship. They did not want to be in a government run by a northern anti-slavery party. After making his way north and speaking with none other than Abraham Lincoln, Davis became a colonel and began recruiting a Texas cavalry regiment. He was briefly captured in 1863 following his return to Texas. He was released and continued to fight in the cavalry. Davis was promoted to Brigadier General in 1864 and became the governor of Texas in 1869. He served only one term, however. Davis died in Austin on February 7, 1883. In terms of Southerners fighting for the Union, Major General John Gibbon is an interesting case. Originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Gibbon moved to a North Carolina plantation when he was just 10 years old. His father owned slaves. He attended West Point and would return to teach there after serving in Mexico, Florida, and Texas. When the Civil War began, Gibbon remained loyal to the Union, unlike the rest of his family. His brothers and cousin all fought for the Confederacy. After becoming a brigadier general, Gibbon led troops at both the Second Battle of Manassas and the Battle of South Mountain, and also fought at the Battles of Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Gettysburg. He was wounded twice. Gibbon became a major general in 1865, and he was present when General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox. After serving in the Army for another 26 years, Gibbon retired in 1891 and died five years later, February 6, 1896, in Baltimore, Maryland. Rear Admiral John Ancrum Winslow was born on November 19, 1811, in Wilmington, North Carolina. At 14, he went north to attend school in Massachusetts, and it changed him forever. For the rest of his life, Winslow would remain a northerner at heart, disregarding his southern ties and staunchly supporting the Union during the Civil War. After joining the Navy as a midshipman in 1827, Winslow served in the Mexican-American War until illness got the best of him, but he returned to fight for the Union in 1861. He was injured again that December, but remained in the Navy and became a captain the following July. He formally gained command of the USS Kearsarge in April 1863, and he sank the infamous CSS Alabama in 1864. That ship was commanded by a former shipmate, Captain Raphael Sims. When word of the Union victory finally reached Baltimore on July 5th, the Kearsarge was an instant celebrity and a symbol of Union naval superiority. After sinking the Alabama, Winslow was promoted to Commodore and later earned the rank of Rear Admiral in 1870. Winslow died on September 29, 1873 in his adopted home in Boston. The first Union general to gain widespread fame and attention, Brevet Major General Robert Anderson, was a Southerner born in Kentucky on June 14, 1805. He joined the Army at the age of 20 and served in both the Black Hawk and Mexican-American Wars. At one point, he even commanded future President Abraham Lincoln, whose election would later become the catalyst for the outbreak of the Civil War. In your hands, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. After Lincoln was elected, Anderson took over as the commander of Fort Sumter in South Carolina. Though the Confederates would take Sumter without much of a fight, Anderson's courage under fire made him a hero to millions of loyal Unionists. Following his surrender, he was made a brigadier general, and Anderson served in the Army of Kentucky for two more years. The illness forced him to retire in 1863. Still, on the fourth anniversary of the fall of Sumter, Anderson was at the fort once again, this time raising the stars and stripes instead of taking them down. In February 1865, Anderson was brevetted to Major General, and he died on October 26, 1871, while in Nice, France. 
Quartermaster General Montgomery C. Meigs was born on May 3, 1816 in Augusta, Georgia. In addition to his military service, Meigs was also widely known for his architectural contributions to Washington, D.C. Meigs graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1831 and immediately entered the U.S. Military Academy. Upon graduating in 1836, he became commissioned as a second lieutenant. However, the majority of his antebellum career would take place in the U.S. Corps of Engineers, where he helped construct the Capitol Dome and extension. During his time in the Engineer Corps, Meigs worked with both future Confederate Top General Robert E. Lee and future Confederate President Jefferson Davis. When the Civil War broke out, Meigs became the Quartermaster General in the Army. This meant he was responsible for logistics to make sure items like clothing, equipment, and other goods were able to make their way from depots to the soldiers in the field. He was uh, irritable. He was very cranky. He was very demanding. Uh, he could be a bore. Without his work, the Union troops would not have been able to maintain their levels of supply during the war, and he was instrumental in both Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman's armies. Following the war, Miggs designed both the Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia, and the Pension Building in Washington, D.C. Miggs died on January 2, 1892, and is buried at the cemetery he helped design in Arlington.